Hi everyone, this is the second mini lecture on instance theory and Minerva 2. In this lecture, we're diving into the details of the Minerva 2 model. You would have read about this model in the assigned reading. We talked about it in the last mini lecture. And uh, the purpose of this exercise is to see how the model works without using too many formulas. And uh, so let's get started. All right. So with Minerva 2, we are modeling a process of, let's say, queued recall. The idea is that when you experience things, the things you experience have some stuff in them, right? There's features in an experience, lots of stuff going on. And we're going to, first of all, in this model, use something called a feature vector to, to express with numbers the concept that an experience has lots of different features. So uh, what I set up in Excel here is something to represent the features that might be in a queue. Uh, and what we mean by a queue is the features of a current stimulus pattern. All right, so that could just be like everything you're looking at right now. Uh, in a memory experiment, we could be referring to the, you know, if I show you a word and I say, what was paired with this word in a previous phase, then this word would be uh, some of the features you'd be paying attention to. Uh, but we were thinking about this in a pretty broad and a pretty abstract way in the model. Uh, so, in Excel, to just demonstrate a feature vector, what I have here is uh, a series of numbers that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten numbers long. And I'm just making it ten because it fits on the screen and we can see everything. But there could be a hundred or a thousand or however many uh, that we want to have in the model. A lot of times I, people might set this to 20 or 100 or something. And uh, we're going to keep it pretty simple in terms of what the numbers are inside of here. Each of the little slots, so there's 10 slots, represents a feature. Uh, a 1 means the feature is there. A 0 means we don't know if it's there. And a negative 1 means it isn't there. So this could mean that feature 1 is present. Who knows if feature 2 is present? Feature 3 is present. No one knows about feature four, feature five and six aren't present, feature seven is present, and so on. And I'm not being specific on what these features are. Um, and that would, uh, we could be specific, but for now, let's just keep them really general. So this is a, a way to describe a pattern, right? Some features are there, some features aren't there, and there's a bunch of specific kinds of features. Uh, the other thing this model has is a memory bank. These are, each row here uh, is a feature vector, and it represents a previous pattern that was experienced. Um, one way to think about it is, I mean, every time you see something, uh, it's a cue to your memory system, and... Um, I guess you would store whatever this thing is here into memory. But uh, for purposes of, of just this part of the Excel spreadsheet, we're assuming that a memory system has had lots of different experiences with different patterns. And these patterns are placed into a memory matrix such that uh, every... Um, Yeah, every row represents a, pri a prior experience. And um, we can do lots of different things in here when we're putting patterns in. Like if we, we could increase the number of zeros, uh, which would be like saying, well, the copying from a per current experience into memory isn't really perfect. And so there's a lot of missing information because of 
noise from the copying process. But these are the two starting points to the Minerva model. So let's talk about how this model retrieves something from memory. And just to prepare you for what you're about to see, if we're going back to the ideas we talked about in the last mini lecture, this is a pattern that you're looking at, and it's supposed to activate individual memory traces based on how similar those traces are to this pattern. And so, for example, if I'm looking through these traces here, I, ha I happen to see this one. It's really similar, right? Uh, if we're just to compare them, I think they're actually the same. One, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, negative one, negative one, so on. So this memory, this cue should really strongly activate this memory because it's highly similar, it's identical. Um, should this cue highly strongly activate this memory? Is it similar? I mean, we can formalize this, but we could also just talk about it a little bit uh, less formally so what you know let's see if we can sort of establish whether it's similar or not are, are the first two numbers the same no are the second two the same yep third yep fourth no fifth sixth seventh yes eight no nine no so what we're, we're kind of like half and half right some of them are the same, some of them aren't the same. So it's certainly a little bit similar, but not 100% similar. Um, so the next step, what we're gonna be doing is coming up with a way to calculate the similarity between this cue and every single pattern in memory. And here's how we do it. I've already, uh, I've already done it, and um, this is the steps. If I was to just jump in here. Take a look at this value. We've got a 0.35 here. Now, what is going on? Um, what I'm doing is I'm using the correlation formula in Excel called C-O-R-R-E-L. And I'm computing the correlation between the Q and the, this memory trace. So this value will be one, positive one, if the two vectors are the same. It will be zero if there's no correlation, and it will be negative one if they're the opposites and it will be any number in between. So I calculated that as a, as a way to think about, it's just a mathematical way to talk about similarity. Um, so we got a 0.35 here. And, you know, that's positive. It's a, a small positive value. This one, this memory trace, we get a, a zero. So, According to the correlation, this pattern is zero similarity to this pattern. This pattern here, I think this is one we kind of talked about out loud, it gets a 0.67. So it's more similar um, than the previous two. This one is a negative similar. And what about this one here? Remember this one, this was, this was the identical one. So we get a, a whole positive one for the similarity. And then the last one, we get a negative 0.17. So these are, we're just using the correlation formula to calculate as a way to represent the similarity values. Now in the model, uh, these values are referred to as activations. 
they represent how strongly activated each memory trace is. So this one here, it's a one. It's the same memory trace. It's going to be the most strongly activated memory trace. How strongly activated is this memory trace? Well, its activation is a big old zero. So it's not being activated. All right. What happens next in the model is that we um, do something called weighting memory by similarity. So what's going on here? What we're doing is we're taking the original pattern in memory, each, each trace, and we're simply multiplying it by its similarity or by its activation. So you see here that um, all of, so this value, it is one times 0.35. This value is zero times 0.35. This value is negative one times 0.35. So all the ones and negative ones here get turned into 0.35s and negative 0.35s over here. Let's go down one. Um, so, so this memory trace, it gets weighted by its activation. So all of the values get multiplied by zero. So all of these values over here tell us how activated that memory trace is. It's all zeros. Um, there's, there's rounding going on. So this one, gets everything gets multiplied by 0.67. So we get 0.67s over here. With rounding, it's just going up to 0.7. Uh, and so on. Um, this memory trace, what happens to it? Well, its activation is one. So this it's like a copy, right? One, if you times one by all these values, you just get the same ones over here. You could think about the, this as a way of um, how loud each memory trace is. So this memory trace is full loudness. It's, uh, it's not being modified. This memory trace has been squished down from a 1 to 0.3s. So it's, it's only 0.3 loud. This memory trace has been totally squished to nothing. So you can't even hear it, right? It's not being activated. The, all of these represent individual memories activated by how similar they are to this pattern out here in the environment. And the very last step is to compute the total memory response. And um, there's two ways to think about the total memory response in the model. And I've got them down here as the echo content, that's these values, and the global activation, which is this value. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the echo content. That's this vector right here. And what it is, we've just added together. Uh, so if you add all these values together, you get a 1.2. If you add all these values together, you get a 0. If you add all these values together, you get a 1.5, and so on. Uh, we've got all these activated memory traces. Some of them are really loud. Some of them are soft. Some of them are very silent. You add them all together, and this is the total composite response. And we call that the echo content. Um, this is another pattern, isn't it? This uh, is a, a pattern of positive values and negative values. And we can inspect this pattern and compare it to other patterns. So one kind of question is, for example, is this pattern here similar to 
the Q. And just by kind of looking at it, you can see, yeah, well, there's some similarities. Like, look at the first value. It's a, it's a positive one, close to. What about the second value? It's a zero in both. Third value? Okay, it's not the exact same, but it's, is it in the right direction? Yeah, they're both positive, and they're both one, you know, positive one or, or greater. But the next value is a zero. So this isn't a zero, but in terms, it's, it's definitely not, um, it's not a positive value. It's less than a positive value. So it's sort of, sort of like this, but they're at zero. Both of these ones are negative ones. We see uh, two negative values in a row. This one's a positive one. And no, get a positive value back. Negative value, negative value, close to zero value, two close to zero values, and two close to zero values. So what we're seeing is the memory responds with a pattern that is kind of similar, quite similar to the Q that it was probed with. Um, we can also ask questions about like, well, what, uh, what patterns are mostly in that echo? And you can kind of, you could kind of see that through the numbers here. Whatever is the loudest, you know, this one here has the biggest numbers. So it's going to really shape the pattern that you would see in the echo. Uh, this one here has really small values. So it will add a little bit to the shape of the pattern, but not a lot. Okay. So another, another thing we can look at in the model is called the global activation. That's this number here. And what this is, it's, it's the sum of the activations. And this is an interesting value to think about. Um, let's say you saw a cue that was super familiar and you had a lot of memories that had this type of pattern in it. Um, that would mean when you see that super familiar thing, lots and lots and lots of your memories are being activated. So a lot of the values here would be positive values. And you'd get a pretty big number if you added up all those values. Kind of tells you how many memories were activated. Uh, in our situation, what have we learned? Well, we've got this one pattern. Uh, that pattern is really only in memory one time. There's a couple other patterns that are kind of similar, but there's really only in memory one time. And our total activation is, it's more than one. So we've got a couple patterns that are kind of similar, so they add up. You get one plus some of these values, a couple are negative. You get 1.67. Um, and I'm just trying to help you anticipate some other possibilities. Like if this, if this pattern was in here a couple times, right? Then we'd have a couple ones or three. And so the activation would be, uh, global activation would be much higher. And, um, and both of these values can be used to evaluate whether the model remembers something or not. So we'll, we'll see some examples of that in a moment. So the next part, uh, let's talk about evaluating model performance a little bit. Uh, and we're going to re, we're going to talk about what I was just saying with one more example. So if this was the pattern to memory that the cue to memory, uh, we've got these traces in memory. One question might be something like, have you seen this pattern before? Is it in your memory? Well, we're going to calculate the similarity between this pattern and all the traces in memory. That's what we've done here. We're going to 
activate each of the traces in memory by their similarity. Then we're going to uh, sum all of these together and get this echo value. So the model does all this stuff, we get all these numbers. And the question might be, okay, so what? Based on these numbers, did the model, will the model say that it's remembered this thing or that it's seen this thing before? Uh, so one, one way to establish this is to compare the similarity between the echo response and the Q response. And I've done that down here. Here's the Q and here's the echo. And this is the correlation using the, the same way we calculated the correlation between the Q and each trace. We're going to calculate the correlation between the Q and the echo right here. And we're getting a 0.97. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to be not recording this. All right, I think the construction work sounds are over for now. So, oh. Okay, so the correlation between the Q and the memory response in this case is 0.97, which is very high. That's a very high correlation. You can you can't you can barely get higher than that. Um, so we might conclude, based on that very high correlation, that yes, the, um, the memory has seen a pattern like this before. Typically, if you were to use this as a model, you might set some type of criterion. Like any time the correlation is greater than 0.8 or 0.7 or something like that, um, you would have the model say that it saw something before. We can mess around with this model a little bit. Like let's say we wanted to test the model, give it a pattern up here that it hadn't seen before. Um, what should it say? Should the correlation be high or low? So um, let's figure out a pattern that we could put in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a pretty distinctive pattern in here, five positive ones and five negative ones. One, two, three, four, five, negative one, negative one, whoops, negative one, uh, two, negative one, and negative one. So that pattern is definitely not in, in memory at all. And uh, notice that the correlation goes down when we compute the memory response. We still get a memory response because even though the memory has not seen this pattern specifically, um, it's still a little bit similar to all of the patterns. So all of the patterns in memory get a little bit activated. Um, and then we get some type of memory response out, but it's not very well correlated with the original pattern. Also, we can see that the total activation isn't very high. It's not even a full one. Uh, so uh, this could be, these numbers could be telling us that, yeah, the model didn't see this thing before because there's not enough support in terms of the pattern being similar and not enough memory traces that were similar were activated. So these are some simple, uh, Simple. Basically, this is the, the whole model and, and, and how it works. So to apply this, um, what we're going to do is uh, look at a couple different, well, should I say this one more thing? Well, okay, I, I'm, I'm missing one little detail of the model, and, and there's a, probably a few others I'm missing. I think it'd be, I guess, let's that it's probably worth talking about them. Uh, see this value here. This is um, a, an exponent. So typically you would calculate the similarities between the probe and each memory trace. And then there is an option here to raise all of those values to an exponent. I've just kept this at one, so we're not changing them. But if we change this to a three, now what's gonna happen here? And uh, well, what happens is if you 
cube decimal values, if you've got a big decimal value, like let's say like a, a 0.99 and you cube it, it's gonna still be close to 0.99. So the big values, values representing high similarity, they're gonna stay pretty big. Smaller values, like a 0.27, they're going to get even smaller. So if I change this to a three, notice that um, all of the small values get even smaller, and, which is to say that uh, it's like a tuning function here. Uh, if the memory traces have a small amount of activation, after applying this uh, exponential rule, they just get kind of filtered out to be zeros. So you have to have a pretty high amount of similarity in the beginning to, um, to influence the echo. So notice here when I put this to a three, this is a way of quieting down uh, memories that aren't very similar. And uh, our correlation went down even more. So th this value is often played around with in the modeling, but I'll just leave it at one for now. So that's a minor detail. Let's move on to seeing how this model can be applied to solve a few different problems. Uh, one of them is queued recall. And that's a theme we established in the, in the earlier mini lecture. So let's take a look at this example. Um, here we have, uh, let's just see. All right, so we have pretty much everything the same as before. Um, I put a three in this one, uh, like we just talked about, but here's what's new. A couple question marks up here to represent a, a kind of a, a queued recall scenario. Now in a, in a typical queued recall task, you'll see two things together. One thing paired with another thing, like maybe a uh, one of these and one of these together, all right? And so later on, um, you might get this back and you have to say, what was it paired with? Then you'd, uh, then you'd have to say, well, it was the headphones. You'd remember that. So in our memory matrix, what I'm doing is I'm creating some pairs. Okay. And check out these ones here. Um, so I'm saying this pattern, which is happens to be 00110000. Okay, this pattern, it's paired with this feature in the in this column, whenever this pattern happens, this thing also happens. And that's happened twice. So this is that same pattern. And this thing happens. I've got a different pattern here. Uh, the one start a bit earlier. So that's a different pattern. And this pattern, uh, it is paired with this thing. And similarly, this pattern is paired with this thing. So hopefully we can all see that there's these three different types of patterns and they're each paired with these different outcomes. All right. So let's go in the model and what, I've, what I'm doing is I'm doing a queued recall procedure. I'm giving it a pattern it's seen before. And the, the question is, well, what was it paired with? So notice I put zeros here. And my question is, uh, can this model retrieve from memory the, the paired associate information? So what's going on? Let's see. We'll take this Q pattern and we calculate 
the similarity to each of the traces in memory as we've done before. And what do we see? Well, um, first of all, this pattern is quite similar to the first two traces, isn't it? Because it's got these two values the same. It's That value is different, so it's not a perfect similarity, but 0.76 is a pretty high similarity. Is this pattern similar at all to the second two patterns? And we get a little bit of similarity, mainly because like this value is this one is also the same. All right, so this is meant to re represent that this pattern, it's it's causing some activation across all of the memory traces. Some are getting activated more than others. And uh, we're weighting the memory traces now by the amount of activation. And then we add them all together to get the echo. And so we can look at the correlation between the queue that's up here and the echo. I've actually plotted them over here. Uh, this can be a nice way to look at the output of the model. So in this plot, uh, so we could see the pattern in the queue. The first two have one, so we see a blue line going up, and then it's zeros everywhere. I've also plotted the pattern of the echo. We could kind of compare. This is what the memory response is. And uh, it's got values close to one in the first two positions, pretty much nothing across all the way. And look what memory did. It retrieved a very positive value in the last position here. And that's the correct response, right? Um, this pattern was paired with something in the last response. If we change the pattern, so for example, let's, what about this last pattern down here? Um, here, the pattern is paired with something in the seventh position, right? This one here. So we could go and probe memory with that pattern. So it's a one there and a one there. And when we put that pattern in, you know, which of these last, which of these last three get um, uh, retrieved by memory? Oh, we get that first pattern back. We could uh, try the, the one in the middle and it gets the second one back. So this is pretty cool. This is how the model can achieve queued recall. And it can even do things like um, get pretty close, even with partial information. So for example, let's say we put a zero here, one here and a zero here. So take a look at this uh, type of pattern. Uh, this exact pattern was never experienced in memory. You could think about it kind of like um, partial information, right? So you get this, this part of, um, the one is there, but it's missing this one. Um, so even though there's only partial information in the pattern, memory will still respond, right? It will, this pattern will still be partially similar to a lot of things. And so uh, what we can see is if you had that type of partial information, memory has an expectation here. It's retrieving an expectation for something in the last position. Uh, I think this type of partial pattern is quite interesting also. So this, this one, you know, is, it's, this is the type of pattern that we saw in the first two memory traces and this, the next two memory traces. So based on that information alone, memory is actually expecting one of two possible things. So you can use a model like this to perform queued recall and potentially even uh, make predictions about the types of expectations people would have for different types of features based on um, the types of individual experiences they've had and based on the types of features in a queue that would be used as a prompt to memory. Let's do two more. 
Um, we've got the next one here is a frequency judgment question. So how could this model be used to uh, explain how people make judgments of frequency? And uh, what we've got in here, we've got uh, a Q pattern. Uh, this pattern, notice, it, let me see if I can just highlight it for you. It is the same as this pattern, the same as this pattern here, the same as this pattern. Um, in other words, this memory matrix has received this pattern three times. Uh, we have a different pattern in, in these two locations, and that is actually the same pattern in uh, two times. And this is yet a third pattern. It's only been presented one time. Now, it turns out people are pretty good at judging how many times they've seen something, or, or they're, they're able to know that they've seen things one time or more than one time. And uh, the inventor of this model, Doug Hintzman, actually ap applied the model to this question of, people can tell how many times they saw something, that is, make a frequency judgment. Um, maybe, you know, how are they doing that? And could a model like this explain how they were doing that? And uh, let me show you how it works. So let's, let's actually, let's take this first pattern. It's, it's the pattern that's only been presented one time in memory. And what we're going to do is we're going to probe memory with that pattern, OK? So I put it in there. It calculates all the similarities. It gets the echo and so on. You get a pretty high correlation suggesting, yeah, we've seen that thing before. Uh, let's take a look at the activation value here. That's, that represents the global activation as how many or the sum of the activations in memory. So we get a 0.48. So just let's just remember that number, 0.48. Uh, now let's go to the second pattern here. I'm just going to grab, copy that, copy that into the queue. So now we're probing memory for the second pattern. And again, we get a nice correlation saying, yeah, we've probably seen that before. But look what happened to the activation value, 2.3. It's jumped up way past, way, way past 0.4. And it's around two, and that's not surprising because we've got two of those things in memory. Both of the similarities are one, and those will add up here to a two, plus a little bit of these other things. Finally, let's take a look at a pattern that has th three examples in memory. We've got a nearly perfect correlation, so that's uh, really good evidence that the model's seen that thing before. And the global activation goes up to three now because uh, three of the traces are perfectly correlated with the Q. Uh, the point here is that the, the value inside of this global activation concept tracks frequency. Mm -hmm. um, so it could you know, potentially be a signal that people are using to make a frequency judgment. To put this back into kind of psychological terms, when you look at something and it causes all of your memories to be activated um, by some amount, you know, not all the memories will be activated, only the most similar memories will be activated. If you uh, were to sort of calculate, well, just how many of your total number of memories are activated, that no, people appear to be some, maybe sensitive to that value. Um, and it's, if you're sensitive to your, the total amount of memory activation you're experiencing, you, you, you might be able to use that uh, signal to make different kinds of inferences. So, for example, if you're experiencing a lot of general memory activation from a lot of your memories, 
uh, the queue that is in front of you, you might have experienced many things like that before because it's causing so much activation. Um, if you're not experiencing a lot of activation, uh, maybe the thing that you, you're seeing, maybe it's novel. Maybe you've never seen something like that before. Do I have one more example? Um, okay, let's talk about schema activation. Now, this isn't really something we've talked about so much in the course, but uh, it's a really neat example here. Uh, it's all about uh, the concept of uh, using individual experiences with a pattern to fill out uh, what that what that pattern is, even if you never saw the the whole pattern before. So here is an example. What I made was a, a simple what I'll call prototype pattern. Let's look at this pattern. It just has five ones and five negative ones. Okay. Now, what I put in memory are what I'll call distorted examples of this prototype pattern. So they're all going to be a little bit like this pattern, but not perfect. So let's see the first one. You know, it, it's um, the first two values aren't ones, um, but otherwise we've got three ones. So the first part's kind of similar. And then the next part, um, they're all negative ones except for this zero, right? Here's another example. Four ones in a row and then a zero. So not quite all four ones. And then negative one, negative one, one, zero, negative one. So these two are off. Um, and we could go down the list here. And what you'd find is that a few of the individual elements are off. So all of these are somewhat similar to the prototype pattern. And we can see that in the similarities that we've already calculated here. But none of them are exactly the, the same. Some of them have incorrect information. Some of them have missing information and so on. What's interesting here is to ask what happens when you present the memory system with this prototype pattern that was the underlying pattern for all of the examples, even though not, this pattern was never shown in memory. So all of the examples here are going to get activated a little bit because they're all a little bit similar. They get weighted by their activations and we get summed up to form this echo. Notice there's a very strong, almost perfect correlation here between the cue and the echo. I've got the cue and the echo plotted over here. And what I want to point out is that the pattern in the echo has essentially perfectly reproduced the qualitative pattern in the prototype. So the prototype pattern is the blue the, uh, rectangles. So like all positive ones, then all negative ones. And the orange represents the memory response, which is all positive followed by all negative. So even though all of the traces in memory never had that pattern, and the traces in memory even had incorrect uh, sort of ups and downs in the wrong places, the global response of memory uh, comes back with a, a resonant pattern that is much like the underlying prototypical pattern here. Um, so this type of process is an example about how seemingly abstract patterns can be retrieved by a memory system um, that only encodes examples and, and even distorted examples at that. 
uh, this part of Minerva was um, an aspect that was also used to, I think, explain um, false memory phenomena that was alluded to in the first mini lecture on this topic. Okay, so this is our Excel, uh, the end of our Excel trip here. I hope this um, give you some idea on, on how people would approach converting instance theory principles into a series of mathematical formalisms. Um, I you know, showed you some examples in Excel here. And uh, so for the rest of the learning module, uh, check out the quiz and the assignment. As I speak now, I'm intending to have an Excel-based assignment that you could also do on Google Sheets that would give you a little bit of, uh, give you some um, practical experience with making something like this if you're interested. And I'll probably also have a, a writing assignment that doesn't involve Excel. So that's it for now. Uh, see you next time.